Let's continue where we left the code from the previous tutorial. In this chapter, we will modify this component to accept any number of inputs. You may proceed the same way for creating components with a variable number of outputs or properties. We start by creating a new property called, number of inputs. Its default value is 2 and cannot be changed during execution. Let's mirror the value as private member for performance reasons. The gain of performance to put in cache this integer is tiny, but this will make more sense for images and big arrays. This step is optional. Let's introduce the dynamic function. This is a virtual function we can override here. We are allowed to create dynamically inputs, outputs and properties only inside this dynamic function. Dynamic will be called only at design time. It won't be called while the diagram is executing, even if the user changes property values. In this context, modifications of your component structure, inputs, outputs or properties can only happen at design time. The component structure cannot change during execution. So at design time, dynamic is called whenever. The component is created on the diagram. A connection is made to the component's inputs. A diagram is loaded and any time one of its property values is modified by the user. Note. Dynamic can be called many times during a diagram loading operation. Indeed, when loading a diagram, the component will be created, its inputs will be connected and every properties will be assigned. However, dynamic is not called between shutdown and the next run if the user does not touch anything on the diagram. Because we will have a variable number of inputs, we need to maintain an array of pointers to our inputs, maps input asterisk. The data callback also has to be changed to receive an array of elements instead of just this fixed set of two elements. We make the modification in the implementation as well. Now, we have to assign this vector of inputs in the dynamic function implementation. This way, it gets updated each time the number of inputs property is changed. We create a loop depending on the number of inputs we have, after clearing the vector since we decided to use the pushback method. We now pass our array of inputs directly here, in birth, at the creation of our input reader object. We also need to tell RT maps that we will do the output allocation ourselves by specifying zero. Indeed, we don't know at this point what the maximum vector size will be. Since it directly depends on the number of inputs our vectorizer component will be configured with. There is a dedicated, first time, callback that we can use for this case. It will be called upon reception of the first set of elements on our inputs, and before we have to publish anything on our output. So it's the right place to allocate the output buffers once we know the size of the data samples we will have to publish. Let's declare and implement this first time callback. Here we add the first time callback to the creation of the input reader. We use the alloc output buffer function to specify manually the maximum number of elements we can publish in our output vectors. The dynamic function is also very useful to perform some checks on variables. Let's check here that the number of inputs property is superior or equal to 2. If not, we can force the property to a specific value with the direct set call. This call will not trigger an extra dynamic call. In the component definition, we cannot use the minus one declaration anymore for the number of inputs. Because we want to use a variable number of inputs, instead of having the component create one input per input model declaration above. We will only keep the first input in the list of declared input models. Every other input will be created in the dynamic function. 
so we set a value of 1. This means the first input is declared statically as is. All other inputs declared in macros become input templates, or models, we can use later on for dynamically created inputs. Let's create the inputs in the dynamic, callback. This is done through the new input, function. We need a name for the input, and the input template to use, which defines the input accepted types, its reader mode. We postfix the name by an index. Then we finally call new input using the second input as template and the name we have just created above. Note. There is no, remove input, delete input, or, destroy input, methods that you can call. Any input that is not recreated from one dynamic, call to the next one will be destroyed automatically. Finally, we need to implement the vectorization part. We simply iterate over the number of inputs and fill in the output buffer. Don't forget to set the vector size accordingly. Let's compile and test this updated component. The number of inputs can be changed at design time and seems to work as expected. If we try to enter a number below 2, we get an error as expected and the value is forced to 2. When using a more complete diagram, we see what we expected on our output. Good job! Now let's react to the change of the factor property during runtime execution. This is possible thanks to the set member function. There are five overloads for the set function. We only need to override the integer function here for the factor property. The set functions are called whenever a property change has been triggered, both at design time or at runtime. We must call the mother class set function from maps component. This will register the new property value in the RT maps engine and will also call the dynamic function in case the engine does not run. If there are several properties of the same type you would like to intercept, you will need to check the property names like this. Now we must indicate to RT Maps that this property is allowed to change during runtime execution. Let's rebuild the package and test it. Now the factor property is not grayed out anymore. We can modify it during execution. Let's enter debugging mode to inspect factor state changes. We set a breakpoint in Visual Studio. We could attach it now to the RT Maps process before running, or later on. Here let's run RT Maps first. Then, attach the debugger like you would do with a DLL, or .so under Linux. Select the RT Maps process and attach to it. Now the debug session is live and our breakpoint is ready to be triggered. Let's change the value of the factor property. This immediately gives focus to the debugger. We can fully inspect variables as usual. You can step in, step out, step into and continue to inspect variables and stack traces. You can also add more breakpoints and then, continue, the execution. Hit the stop debugging button when you are done with your session.